Freedom of the press is only guaranteed when you own the press. Communication breakdown. Pause for the message. Wake up. Every station is identification. Global syndication is the shaping of the nation. ABC, Disney, NBC, GE, Murdoch is Foxy, and with a hint, he owns a pen. The camera, the sword, by a coke, by a Ford, getting broke, getting bored. And experience yours. From the earliest days, freedom of the press was what defined America. Thomas Jefferson, who helped write the Declaration of Independence, believed a free media was essential for a free nation, saying were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. That was in 1787. Today, our newspapers seem to be fading in importance in a multimedia world that is largely owned and controlled by a handful of large media corporations. I think we're probably the most media-dominated society in the world. Jeff Cohn worked in major media. Now he's one of the industry's fiercest critics. Half a dozen corporations own and control most of the mainstream media in our country. So if you're looking at who rules America or who owns America, it's the same people that propagandize to America. The press and the outlets that report news or convey information are just a small slice of vast media empires producing entertainment products that also sell a way of life based on consumption. When you look at who's on the boards of media corporations, they're also on the boards of U.S. oil companies, and they're on the boards of uh, U.S. military contractors. So uh, trying to study who owns America, you're really also, these are the people that own the media. We don't have a state media, but in some ways it's very much like a state media. It's the corporate state. If this is true, then we can say that the American media doesn't just report news. As we'll see, it's not independent of the system, but a pillar of it. It reinforces the worldview and defends the interests of those who rule America. Thirty years ago, 50 companies dominated American media. Now it's down to six. Here are some charts on media ownership that illustrate this concentration. With new global digital enterprises like Google, Facebook, and Twitter growing in importance worldwide, U.S.-based media became a transnational force. The U.S. media companies are themselves owned in large part by hedge funds, mutual funds, and finance companies. Barry James Dyke is an asset manager who has studied media ownership. The research which I've done is, is, is unequivocal, and I kind of stumbled into this, is that um, the, the media companies, the major media companies, i.e. the Disney's, the CBS's, the news corporations, all of them, this is all public documents, is that they're all owned, actually owned by Mutual fund companies, the majority shareholders are owned by mutual fund companies. So, um, and also, they also get a lot of their revenue from these companies. So you're never going to see any consistent criticism about these fund companies. Are these companies investigated by the media? No, they're not. Are they responsible uh, to the public in some way? Are they accountable? Do the public really know what they're doing? The public really doesn't have a clue. They, they really don't know what they're doing. He has documented his findings with charts in his own book, The Pirates of Manhattan. Well, people are not going to be getting, not getting the truth. But there is a lot of coverage, especially of politics, that's often treated as a sporting event, with an emphasis on poll numbers and election results. Mary Boyle follows media coverage of elections for common cause. What about the role of the media? Is the media helping to strengthen our democracy, or do you think it's helping to divide us? Well, I, I think that's a great question. I, I think that, um, you know, there are a couple of things going on there. Obviously, you've got kind of cable channels that are, you know, in different camps, and they are not showing different points of view. You've got Fox News showing the right. You've got MSNBC showing the left. Um, 
and so with a setup like that, you you have Americans that are just kind of tuning in to the channel they want to listen to that you know kind of expresses their views, and and you're not seeing kind of a mix of an opinion, a debate, anything like that. You've also got you know the shrinkage of of the media. Um, you've got less coverage of of what's going on, and I think this is particularly concerning uh, more around kind of state-based and and local politics, um, where there's even less coverage of, of what's going on in politics. But even as the world is known for its diversity, American media is not. Editorially and ideologically, the power elite tends to reflect the views of the government and the people who shape its views. Dissenting politicians like Congressman Jesse Jackson Jr. have a hard time getting their views heard. Who owns the media? how the media is translated, some of the moguls and the titans of media and industry are part of the problem. They shape a narrative for the American people, a narrative that ultimately leads millions of people to vote for candidates based upon the narrative that they shape, based upon the talking heads that they control. And those Americans tend to vote and tend to engage the system on the basis of that which they hear. Media is a significant part of this problem. Historian Eric Foner agrees. He says it's not just political bias at work, but what the media as a business feels it's forced to focus on to attract ratings and revenues. Somehow that idea of, of power uh, behind the people in office uh, is not really in our media very much. It's not really in people's minds very much. They personalize politics. There are personalities combating each other, but they don't look at who's behind the scenes. Well, you, you're quite right that uh, the media focuses on personalities, you know, and, and, and often the quirks of personality, Clinton's uh, sexual escapades, or whether Obama was born in the United States or not, or Romney and his uh, cars and whatever, you know, his not paying taxes and many other things. Those are not totally unimportant issues, but maybe it's the nature of the media today in and of itself, in that it, it, you know, it has to go for the quick news. Deep investigative reporting is not emphasized as much as perhaps it was in the past. And um, you know, you got to sell papers, and scandal sells papers, um, personality sells papers, celebrity sells papers. So uh, you're right that the, you know, the. The larger nature of how the system operates tends not to get emphasized as much. It's not even understood by many people. Well, it's hard to understand. This is a very large country, over 300 million people, a very, very complicated economy and political system. So it's, it's difficult to understand exactly how things operate. But I think, but, but I think you know, in a certain sense, the anti-government sentiment, which is rife in this country, which is generally associated with the right wing, is also a response to the feeling. It's an inchoate feeling. It's not an analytical feeling, but it's a feeling that government is aloof. It is not responsive. It does not really represent the people. It represents some very particular interests. And that sense is pretty widespread in this country. Media watch groups are also concerned about the lack of diversity within the media that makes it unrepresentative of the country it serves in racial, ethnic, and gender terms. The unwritten uh, credo of the New York Times is do not uh, alienate those for whom we depend uh, on, for money and access. Chris Hedges was an award-winning journalist for the New York Times, an American media star. And that means the uh, power elite uh, and the financiers who advertise. Uh, so, uh, but but it's it's expandable. I mean, you have you have at least in the positions that I was in the possibility uh, to do journalism. Not that there aren't you know restrictions or constrictions. There are, um, and, and not that they can't be punishing. Hedge's work is still very respected. But he believes that much of the press is ultimately a charade that covers up for power more than covers it, especially when reporting on elections. 
because the political theater, I mean, the, the personal narrative of the candidate, it's all irrelevant. It, it, it's meaningless. Uh, it, and, and and people, we, you know, we still play the game. Look, every uh, totalitarian country I covered had elections. They all play the charade. I mean, even East Germany did. Uh, and uh, and that's the charade we play. And when we have a compliant corporate media that pretends that that charade is real. Um, so I think... Uh, the problem is that the illusion still remains so powerful. I, but people are, are changing, but the illusion is still so powerful that people confuse where power actually exists. How does the New York Times cover the power centers that many people say rule America? Chris Spanos edits the New York Times Examiner that monitors the newspaper's content every day. He believes the paper has become an accomplice to the power elite. The New York Times as an institution is almost like a mini nation and, and, the, and the correspondents, the, the op-ed writers, the editors, they're almost like diplomats and how they, they, they carry themselves and their own self-importance and in the way that they communicate with other politicians and, and diplomats and they are very influential. Would you say that they're a disseminator of ideology in America, not just of information? That, Absolutely. They're, they're, they disseminate a very particular ideology in that their readership is primarily uh, managers um, and, and people who make around over $90,000 a year. And, and so they cater to a managerial perspective. And, and so they, they have a pro-management, when, when they're discussing labor relations, they often have a pro-management view, a pro-business view. Financial journalists like Stacey Herbert and Max Kaiser found that many pro-business views in some media outlets were often uninformed, as they told me on a radio show. From December 2008, so well after the collapse of Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, the market's tumbling a thousand points in a day, and the head of BBC World News Business said, and we had a 10-episode contract, do you think the financial crisis will last all the way through these 10 episodes? So in other words, the people actually in charge of planning the coverage are, are, are very uninformed themselves. Well, the, the mainstream media are themselves deeply in debt. You know, the, the news organizations have become entertainified, and, and to compete, they take on enormous amounts of debt. So the bankers, they don't want to, uh, to, to, to insult their creditors uh, because they might cut off their lines. Uh, of credit, so they don't have, they're not unbiased in this regard in, in any stretch of the imagination. You see this most spectacularly with the New York Times. They, their, their coverage of the Wall Street is, is pitiful. To my world. One reason the press is so pro-business is that they are themselves businesses. The people who run media companies increasingly pay themselves huge salaries and bonuses, the same way that bankers do, says Barry Dyke. <laughs> yeah, Les Moonves, I couldn't believe it. he made uh, 59 million in 2009 and he racked up, it, it was just as close the other day that he made close to 70 million in uh, 2010. And that's the head of CBS. That's the head of CBS. But you're saying that all of them are, are really running their businesses as if they were banks. I mean, that's pretty good. That's banker pay. I mean, 70 million dollars is a lot of money in anyone's book and that's what they're getting paid. So the, the, the media companies are really part of this whole system of who rules America. They're, they're part of these interconnecting, interlocking relationships with financial institutions. There's no question about, there's no question about it. You get the, the media companies, which are huge. It's part of the empire. You get the media companies. You get the bankers, of course. You have the, your, your massive you know, uh, unions, OK? You have um, uh, other uh, factors as well. But those are, the media is definitely part of it, and the asset managers. That's exactly it. The corporations that own the U.S. media and own U.S. television are very wealthy and very powerful. And the people at the top of the news networks get paid an awful lot of money. I have never earned anything close to the amount of money I earned in the one year I worked where General Electric was my boss at MSNBC. So what I think happens is a self-censorship where the people who rise to the top have learned how not to rock any boats, and they know if they do rock boats, they will lose their huge salaries. Newspapers like the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal tend to frame a deeper narrative that tells us what we should believe matters. 
They set the agenda that influences what TV news programs also cover. For example, they don't focus on inequality and class differences, says independent media executive Brian Droulet. Do it. They don't talk about the working class, and part of it is, it's like the, the the idea that you know they promote this idea that you know if you buy a lottery ticket you could win, right? So you're already thinking that maybe you could win. So if you're in the if you're in the working class or you're part of the working class that's unemployed, um, you still have this hope that somehow you're going to go into the middle class. There's been very little attention paid to class. I mean, you were saying that the media really doesn't discuss this. They don't really. Uh, highlight class differences in America. They're much more comfortable talking about racial differences or ethnic differences. At the same time, in their business practices, they're very conscious of demographics. What class are they attracting? Upper class, how to cater their advertising, how to sell it. No, they go, I mean, you know, the internet is a perfect example of that Google everything where they're constantly slicing and dicing who you are so they know exactly how much you make so they can pitch what kind of products to you. But that's, that's this whole sort of madness of the consumer society that's been created by modern capitalism. But the, the key thing I think that you're getting at is, is that even though there is a reality of class, a working class in this country and a ruling class or a bourgeois class, People have been trained not to think in those terms, so they don't even know who they are. Some networks, like Fox News, owned by Rupert Murdoch, seem to be more comfortable presenting a right-wing political line. They have helped shift many media outlets to the right. There is a school of thought that says we should have given the citizens of Baghdad 48 hours to get out of Dodge and flatten the place. Then the war would be already over, and we could have done that in two days. That may be so, but old media is being eclipsed by the new, says George Scribner, the vice president of Digitas, a company that comes up with digital strategies for big companies and studies how affluent consumers now drive marketing in an era of growing economic inequality. The one thing that's different now is that the media is owned by everyone. You know, there's, there's the only th the thing that's kind of leveling off the dollars to some extent is that everyone has access to Twitter, everyone has access to blogging, and there's this new kind of fast and fluid coalition building, like Occupy Wall Street was one example of that, uh, the Arab Spring was an example of that. So in some ways, kind of the, the, there's the check, there's a new check and balance. And I don't think that's necessarily changing the restructuring of income and wealth, but I do think there's another trip switch that, that might help us when things get too bad. So the digital media, in a yes. way, is where democracy exactly. is today. It's not in politics, yes. it's not in big business, it's not in big money. That's true, I think that's well said. There is some debate on how free the internet really is, given corporate control and government censorship, but it does make possible more interactivity. At the same time, media attention still tends to revolve around a political elite with authority, even if that elite doesn't necessarily have the power to shape priorities or impose policies. But when you talk to ordinary Americans, many of them feel it's totally fair. Yeah. They're seeing different points of view. They're seeing people who are critical from time to time. They're, yeah. you know, they see the media as the liberal media in some instances. I, I was in the Soviet Union, and it was we were always raised in this country that that's pure propaganda, and frankly, it was very ineffective propaganda because they never pretended to have two points of view. They would have some one point of view saying how great things are. But in our country, propaganda is really effective because they have the appearance of debates. The United States of America will not permit the world's most dangerous regimes to threaten us with the world. Jeff Cohn says that just as Americans were misled about Iraq before the war, they are being misled today about Iran. He pointed to a study about Iraq before the American invasion that found that of some 393 people who were interviewed on all the networks, only three were anti-war. Because almost everything we knew about Iraq before the invasion turned out to be false. And almost everything we're learning today about Iran is uh, not accurate. And we, you know, we went to the New York Times a couple months ago where they said that the International Atomic Energy Association has put out an assessment 
that the nuclear program in Iran has a military objective. And the FAIR, this media criticism group, went to the Times and said, which report is that? We've never heard of it. The Times knew they'd made a big error. It was a prominent error. They removed the sentence from their website, but they refused to correct the error. It's not just wars that get propagandized. Media does not often cover the people behind the scenes who run things, says William Hartong, who has written about the military-industrial complex. You would think there would be some independence in the journalism on this issue. But in some cases, reporters have even said to me, well, you know, I can't go after the Pentagon harder or the companies harder uh, or this nexus of influence harder because uh, this company is a big advertiser in the paper and we'll get pressure you know, if we do those kinds of stories. So we'll do stories about the war in Afghanistan, we'll repeat what the president has to say on an issue, but there's not really a lot of interest or resources put into investigating these kinds of connections. David Swanson, who also writes about military policy, agrees. Well, the corporate media in the United States is integrated with the military-industrial complex. Some of the same corporations are making profits from both. Uh, there are two major political parties that don't have much disagreement on this topic, so it's not a topic for debate. Uh, no matter if 90 percent of the public is upset about it, it's not acceptable news. Michael Clare, who's investigated the destructive power of oil and gas companies, says the same is true when it comes to that industry. The media doesn't cover this for the most part. In fact, the media is largely in league because of the advertising dollars that the oil and gas lobby provides. They're very heavily dependent on advertising revenue, so they're very careful in what they say. Big business, a wealthy and frequent advertiser in the media, is often not scrutinized by the media. That was the case in the financial crisis, says Sheila Krumholz of the Center for Responsive Politics. So these are complicated issues. The issues are, are, are difficult to understand on a good day, and they seem, again, very arcane and, and unimportant to the average American. Uh, so it's possible that, that some media were... Uh, uh, laboring away, trying to explain why this was uh, critical information that the voters need. I think a lot of uh, blame, though, can be laid at the, at the feet of the media for the financial collapse. Ultimately, what we do know is that it's critical. If, if, there, if there's any uh, perfect uh, scenario that shows why transparency and paying attention and scrutinizing the, the powerful players and what they want and what they're doing to get, uh, to get their way, uh, the financial crisis is, is that perfect example. It shows us how important transparency is. Because significant wealth demands significant attention. Together we can give you and your wealth the wings to soar. Goldman Sachs Wealth Management. At the same time, media has become so pervasive online and off on TV and on our mobile phones that many Americans say they are becoming victims of information overload. The more they watch, the less they know. For sure, information overload is, I think, a, a, a serious threat uh, to democracy because it doesn't work if people aren't vigilant. Uh, nobody's going to... Uh, hold uh, uh, members of Congress accountable for you. You have to uh, take. Uh, you have to make sure that you're heard. Uh, I think there's also the the sense that because there is this tension, and some would say healthy tension, uh, between uh, concern about uh, protecting the process, and democracy, and government from money's undue influence versus protecting freedom of speech and privacy. Uh, nobody wants to uh, censor information. We want our representatives to have all the information, even if it's coming from deep-pocketed corporations, unions, or trade associations. Very narrow interests. We just want to make sure that they are doing their job to seek alternative perspectives, even if they're coming from groups that have no power and have no money. Media criticism tends to revolve around what's being covered and not covered, and not on the way media narratives shape how we think and what we think about. That's the power of media and why it is now among the forces ruling America.
coming up in the next episode of Who Rules America? Money now controls politics. And you look at our system is so broken, nobody in their right mind would try to copy our system if they wanted a real democracy. Next time on Who Rules America?